Savior. Ain't we say that tonight? What a Savior we serve. Take your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 1. And we're going to be looking tonight in verses 5 through 12, but I just kind of want you to hold that place for just a minute because we're not there yet, okay? Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 12. You know, a lot of times we ask God the why question. God, why did you allow this to happen? God, why did this happen to me? And then there are other times we ask the question, God, how can I be sure? How can I be sure that when I die I'm going to go to heaven? How can I be sure that I'm saved? God, how can I be sure that you're going to keep this promise? Or how can I be sure your will's going to be done? In my life. In verse number 18 of Luke chapter 1, it says, And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? In other words, Zechariah turned to the angel Gabriel and said, How can I know this for sure? How can I know this to be true? And then he said, Whereby, for, or for I am an old man, and my wife, well stricken in years. Father, help us to know tonight that we can be sure of so many things, of all things, when it comes to you. Father, you've told us you'll never leave us nor forsake us, that all of your promises will be fulfilled. And Father, you'll never, ever let us down. And I just thank you for that tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, in the, the very last book, of the Old Testament, the very last words of the last book in the Old Testament. In Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, we read, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of that great and dreadful day of the Lord. And verse number 6 says, And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers. It says, Lest I come and smite them. The earth with cause. The Gospel of Luke breaks a silence that started when these words were spoken in Malachi. The Gospel of Luke breaks a silence that lasted for over 400 years. I want you to understand tonight that Luke's Gospel begins precisely where the prophet Malachi left off. And Luke begins his story with an angelic announcement. The angel Gabriel comes to Zacharias, or Zechariah, whether you're looking at the New Testament name or the Old Testament name. He was an elderly priest. He and his wife were going to have a son. The angel Gabriel came and made an announcement. It says this son's going to come in the spirit of Elijah the prophet. And he will turn the hearts of the father to the children and will prepare the way of the Lord. I think every one of us would say tonight that we want some kind of certainty in life, don't we? We want some kind of assurance in life that the things that we believe in are real, that the things that we believe in are true. And that's kind of the story of Zechariah. It's a story of Zechariah who heard this promise that God was going to give him and his wife a child, and, and he's having this struggle. Even though he hears it from an angel, he's having this struggle, and he's saying, how can I be sure? How can I know that this is, this, this is true? In spite of Zechariah's godliness, his obedience to the law, and a lifetime of serving God, a lifetime of ministry, to God. When the angel Gabriel comes up and makes this announcement, Zechariah's faith was weak. His faith was weak when it came to believing that something like this could actually be true, that something like this could actually be real. And Zechariah says in verse 18, Whereby shall I know this? How do I know that what you're saying is really going to come to pass. How can I be sure? You know, 
I believe most of us, when God fulfills a promise to us or says something to us in a supernatural way, sometimes we would say, well, God, I want to believe you. God, if you'd just show me a sign. God, maybe if you'd just send an angel my way. If maybe if something would happen in a supernatural way, God, I wouldn't doubt you. God, I would, I'd believe you. But here's Zechariah. And God has sent him a sign from heaven. God has sent him an angel, and it's still not enough. Zechariah said, how can I know this to be true? You know, we're first introduced to Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth in verses 5 through 7. It says, but there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zechariah of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinance of the Lord blameless. And they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both now well stricken in years. Zechariah and his wife were good people. They were certainly not important people, they lived in a little village in the hill country of Judah. But folks, here's what's important from those verses. What was important was their spiritual devotion to God, their walk with God. Luke describes them as both, not just Zacharias, not just Elizabeth. He said they were both righteous before God. But folks, they were not perfect but they were set apart from other people because of the way that they walked with God, because of their obedience to God, because of their righteousness. And the only sorrow that Zacharias had and Elizabeth had was that they were old and they had no family to call their own. Zechariah was a priest. And you've got to understand something about being a priest in those days. The woods were full of them, so to speak. In fact, there were so many of the priests in those days that they had to divide them into 24 groups. And each group would serve at the temple for a week, one time, twice a year. And it was time for that division to serve. The priest that was to serve would go to Jerusalem. Verses 8 and 9 says, And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course according to the custom of the priest's office. His lot, it, 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 it was his time. Finally, it was Zechariah's time to go to Jerusalem. It was to go into the temple, his time to burn the incense. His lot was to burn the incense when he went to, into the temple of the Lord. <coughs> Every day for that week, one of those groups, out of one of those groups, one person would be chosen to burn incense in the temple, in the holy place. And because there were so many priests, they were only allowed to burn the incense once in their lifetime. And sometimes they didn't live long enough to have an opportunity to burn the incense. They never got a chance to do it. For a priest to receive the honor of burning the incense was to be one of the greatest days of that priest's whole life. And finally, it says, the lot turned to Zechariah. It was his time. And I'm sure that his heart was filled with awe. I'm sure his heart was filled with fear. I'm sure his heart was filled with joy when he finally had an opportunity to step into that holy place. But look in verses 9 through 12. According to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time. Zechariah went into the temple to burn the incense. And everybody was standing outside praying for him as he prayed for them and as he burned the incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear 
fell upon him. He goes into this holy place. He is the only one in this place, folks. He's filled with fear already, filled with awe already, and suddenly there's an angel in his presence. And this angel began to speak prophecy. Prophecy which had ceased at the close of the Old Testament. This is the first time it had happened for 400 years. And the Bible says that Zacharias was troubled and fear fell upon him. I think that's an understatement, folks. When an angel appeared at the right side of the altar of incense and began to speak to him prophecy that hadn't been spoken in 400 years, I think he was much more than just troubled. I think there was a little more than just a little fear that fell upon him. Folks, he just wasn't startled. He was terrified at the sight of the angel Gabriel. Here's old Zacharias going about his religious duties. I don't think he ever thought about meeting God in that holy place, do you? I think he was thought about what his responsibilities were what his duties was, what his ministry was. You know, I was reading this the other night, and I wonder how many of us come to church expecting to meet God? How many of us come to worship and expect for God to actually be in our worship? Folks, we come to worship, but a lot of times we don't have any idea that God actually might show up and that we might have an encounter with God. And like a lot of people today, Zacharias seems uh, to believe in God, but he never thought God would actually work in his life, would actually show up in the holy place. He served God, but he was not ready for God to speak to him personally. Folks, listen, what would happen to us if God spoke to us personally? What would happen to us if God showed up in church? I'm going to tell you something. He's here tonight, folks. He's in this place tonight. We need to recognize His presence tonight. But here was Zechariah. He was not ready when God spoke to him personally. He didn't live expecting God to act in his life in this way. I want you to think about how you would have felt if you were standing in that holy place. You were all alone. You were the only one to allowed to come in. And suddenly you were burning the incense and you realized that there was somebody in that holy place with you. You realized you were not alone. You realized there was something, somebody else there. Verse 13 tells us that the angel, angel realized that Zacharias was a little bit terrified. He realized how startled he was. You know what the first words was he spoke to Zacharias? The angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias. You don't have to be afraid of me. God sent me. But the angel's next words, folks, were a bombshell. He said, Zacharias, you don't have to be afraid. I've come from God. But the next words were, Thy prayers is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear a son and shall call his name John. He says, Zacharias, you don't have to be afraid. He reassures Zacharias that his prayers are being heard. God has heard his prayer. It's took a long time, but God has been faithful. God's going to answer his prayers. Folks, it's no doubt Zechariah and Elizabeth had been praying for the redemption of Israel. There's no doubt he had been praying himself as a priest for the redemption of Israel. And he had been praying a long time for he and his wife to have a child, but they'd probably give up on those prayers. He might not have prayed them for a while. And the angel says that his wife is going to bear a son. And you're going to give him a name, not just any name. You're going to give him a name, John. And the angel continues in verses 14 through 17 to reveal the character of this very special child that they're going to call John. Verse 14 says, And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. 
for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine or strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the father to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Folks, this was going to be John. This man was going to be the one they were going to call the Baptist. He was going to be an extraordinary man. He was going to have a great heart. Jesus would later say about John the Baptist in, in, in 728, He said, For I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there is a greater, not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And Zacharias in verse 18 asked the question, And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, my wife is well stricken in years. In spite of Zechariah's godliness, his obedience to the law, in a lifetime of ministry and service to God, his faith was weak. And I want you to know because his faith was weak, because his faith was limited, he paid the price. Because of his unbelief, the angel said in verses 19 and 20, the angel said unto him, I'm Gabriel. Zechariah said, how can I know this for sure? The angel said, do you know who I am? I'm Gabriel. That stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings, this blessing that's going to come to you and your wife. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed because thou believest not my word. Because of thou unbelief, you're, not going, you're going to be deaf and dumb till this baby is born. Because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled, which God is going to come, cause to come to pass in due time, in God's time. Gabriel says to Zechariah, he said, you may be an old man and your wife may be well stricken in years, but I'm Gabriel and I've come from God. In other words, he's saying, O ye of little faith. And Zechariah is asking, how can I be sure? I'm asking, he said, I want a sign. And Gabriel says, this is a sign. He said, you're going to be temporary, deaf, and mute until the birth of your son when God fulfills the promise. And in verse 21 through 25, said, The people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. Well, he is terrified. He is afraid. He just heard this promise from God. And now he can't speak. And he's sitting in the temple. And it says in verse 22, when he finally came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. For he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus has the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked upon me to take away my reproach among men. The people waited and waited and waited for Zechariah to come out, and when he finally came out, he couldn't speak to him. The people couldn't understand it. They didn't understand what had happened to him in the temple. Verse 24 says, And after those days, his wife Elizabeth had conceived and hid herself five months. This hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked upon me to take away my approach among men. Folks, listen. God kept his promise. 
He always keeps his promise. In spite of Zacharias's years and Elizabeth's years, they had a child. Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 32, verse 17, Ah, Lord God. I love that. Ah, Lord God. Behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing, nothing too hard for thee. Not only was she able to have a son, but the birth of her son was evidence that the Messiah is coming because John came to prepare the way of the Messiah. Folks, these were exciting days for Zacharias and for Elizabeth, but there were sec- uh, exciting days for all of God's people. And the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth has something to teach us about <coughs> understanding how God works. First, our responsibility is just to believe. Not to question, just to believe. Folks, our impossibilities are just platforms that God uses to do His best work. And when something looks impossible, that's when God does His best work. When you've come to the end of your hope, remember, there's nothing God can't do. Secondly, God's delays are never knows. Never confuse a God's weight with a no. When faced with a weight, we can either allow it to cause us to doubt, like Zacharias and Elizabeth did, or we can use that time to grow in our spiritual walk and grow closer to God so that when God keeps that promise, we're better able to receive it. And third, when God chooses to intervene in our lives, it's always for His glory and for His good. He blessed Zacharias. He blessed Elizabeth. But who got the glory out of it? God did. And God may not answer our prayers in a way that we expected, in the time that we expected, but He'll always answer it in a way that's best for us. You know, there may be some of us that came into this place tonight asking the same question Zacharias asked. How can I be sure, God? I want to know that it's possible that you're going to do what you said you're going to do. Folks, I want you to know that you can leave here tonight with all your wise answer. You can leave here tonight and be sure. Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 27, He said, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. He said the same thing Jeremiah did. Is there anything too hard for me? With God, all things are possible. If you came here today speaking some certainty about spiritual things, maybe you're experiencing a struggle in your life. Folks, any uncertainty, any fear in your life, if you'll just turn it over to God right now, God will take care of it. There is nothing too hard for God. And that's what we need to do, folks. You've heard me say so many, many times, this is God's church. We need to turn this church over to God. And we need to say, God, there's nothing too hard for you. God, you take care of your church. You empower your church. You give wisdom to your church. And we need to pray that same prayer for us. He'll empower us. He'll give us wisdom. He'll help us to do and accomplish His perfect will. If you're asking tonight, if there's any uncertainty in your life, just turn it over to God. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Father, if there's anyone here tonight that's lost without you, I just pray tonight, Father, that you would just speak to their heart and help them to know how lost they are without you. Help them to know that the only way to be saved is to turn to Jesus. Father, I pray for those who need to come put their life in our church. I pray for those who need to come tonight and follow Jesus in believer's baptism. Or for those that have uncertainty, any kind of uncertainties in their life. And you might be saying tonight, how can I know this to be true? How can I be sure? God will help you to know that and understand that tonight. Father, this is your time of invitation. You use it tonight. 
any way you see fit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our hymn of invitation. If you need to come, come tonight, would you? Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on.